Alcoholics and addicts have a problem, but their problem affects and damages their families, spouses, and children. How addiction affects the family. That's our topic as we're set to go live or call the doctor right now. Call the doctor. WVIA's award-winning health care program. Moderated by George Thomas. Call the doctor. Hello, welcome to Call the Doctor, live from your public media studios, I'm George Thomas. Consider this a 22 county-wide intervention, an intervention for the families that suffer in silence. More than one half of adults in the United States have a close family member who has abused alcohol or is addicted to drugs. That's over one half, folks. Families of alcoholics and addicts, it's a subject people don't talk about, especially those who are involved. Now this show will, will not be about the alcoholic or the addict, but about the families, spouses, and children in that home, what they are going through and how they are effective. And if you don't think you are affected, let me just set you straight right now. You are, and more than you realize. Of course, over the next hour, we'll tell you about the tremendous help there is for you, and there is help, and more than you realize. For those watching that are living in this situation, this isn't going to be an easy show for you to watch. You're going to want to turn away. I'm asking you not to. No one in the family is spared the effect of alcohol or drug addiction. Just trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Stay with us for the next hour and you will get help. Of course, you could join and be a part of the program by dialing that toll-free number on the bottom of your screen or you can go to our online community at wvia.org in the upper right hand corner you click on the button and you could submit your comments and by the way when you're calling in on the toll-free number if you'd like to be anonymous that's fine as well and again it could be with your comments or question I'd also, I'd like to also uh, thank our live studio members that are here with us this evening and uh, you'll be hearing from them as well well, we've assembled regional experts and they're ready to help. Let's meet them right now. Our first guest is Dr. David Withers, who practices addiction medicine and serves as the Associate Medical Director for the Marworth Chemical Dependency Treatment Center. That's a part of the Geisinger Health System. Our next guest is Trish Colangelo, a certified addiction counselor and consultant for the Family Focus Program at Clearbrook Treatment Centers. Also joining us is Judge Michael J. Barace from the Lackawanna County Treatment Court and the National Drug Court. And our fourth guest is Vince Carolyn, a licensed social worker and a certified alcohol and drug counselor for A Better Today Incorporated and also he's an adjunct faculty member at Misericordia University. And we have with us a part of, as part of our studio audience, Suzanne Jaffe. Uh, she is a mother of a 28-year-old son who has remained sober now for seven years. Now, what makes Call the Doctor so very unique is the ability for you to interact live with our region's finest experts for an hour as we go beyond the trending news soundbite and offer real information and help for you and your family. So we're going to open up our toll-free lines right now and give you the opportunity to ask your questions about how addiction affects the family. Thank you for being here, and everybody in the audience as well, thank you for showing up and being here as well. Uh, let me get right to it and set the stage. And I tried to do that a little bit in the beginning. And uh, Dr. Withers, we'll start with you. And this is a quote, this kind of sums this up. Now, we're not gonna, again, we're not gonna make a distinction between an alcoholic or an addict. So those two words are gonna be interchangeable throughout the, the whole uh, one hour. But let me read this quote and then have you uh, comment about this. Uh, it comes under the section of the question, why do I need help? He's the alcoholic. Okay, so this is the wife making this quote. And she says this, or the comment is, is this. One minute uh, he is, or she is screaming at the alcoholic, threatening him with everything from divorce to death. And the next minute she may be compassionately rescuing him from the consequences of his latest episode dutifully cleaning up his messes, making excuses for him, and accepting an increasing degree of unacceptable behavior. The truth is, the disease of alcoholism has affected her life. 
her attitude and her thinking perhaps more dramatically than has the drinking spouse, and she may not even realize it. She has slowly been drawn into thinking that the alcoholic should be protected. She has learned to cover for him, lie for him, and hide the truth. She has learned to keep secrets no matter how bad the chaos and insanity all around her has become. Few have been affected by the disease of alcoholism realize that by protecting the alcoholic with the little lies and deceptions to the outside world, she has actually created a situation that makes it easier for him to continue and progress. Rather than help the alcoholic and herself, she has actually enabled him to get worse. I'm going to credit the University Alliance uh, website for that quote. People that go through this, and again, this shows about the families that, are, are, that know or have a loved one that's an addict or an alcoholic, they don't understand this. Why not? It's the nature of the disease. It's on the list of diseases I know something about. Um, I practice addiction medicine, probably a little bit more importantly than that. My father drank a quart of whiskey a day for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I know all of those feelings. I know exactly what that quote feels like. And I know all of those deceptions. And I know all of those manipulations. And I know how bad they feel as family member. What's wrong, and again, interchangeable throughout the whole program between an alcoholic or addict, we're not going to make that distinction. Um, how is the family unit different? And, and again, we're not going to distinguish that, yeah. that the father is the addict or, sure. the alcohol or, the, or the mother, or it could be the teenager. Yeah. So somebody in that family unit is an addict or alcoholic. What does that do to the family? Basically, it shreds it over time. It, it, it shreds the soul and fabric of the family unit. And, and the disease is so insidious and the effects are so insidious that it's, and, and it happens so slowly that very few people recognize it mm -hmm. and, until the enabling systems, the rescuing systems, the excuses, the whatever it might be, uh, end up so profound that if they were thought about on day one, they would seem like they were from a different planet. Let me go next, and again, we're, we're, we're setting this up. Um, and Trish, I want to come to you on this one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a setup. Okay, and I'm going to read this scenario and then I'm going to ask our panel to talk about the, the, the four different types of people and how they react. And uh, then we're going to have a, a quote after that. So the scenario is this, follow along with this. The alcoholic come home, comes home late uh, from work and he's drunk. Too drunk, in fact, to get the key in the front door lock. After several futile attempts, he decides that it's a lost cause. Since he does not want anyone in the house to know that he's too drunk to unlock his own door, he makes a brilliant decision and solves his problem. He goes to sleep in the front yard. So now there's four main ways people react. Now, the first one would be the rescuer. So tell me about that person, how they would, how they're reacting to that situation. The rescuer would try to go help and get the person in, regardless of whether they were 90 pounds and the person's 250 pounds. They feel that somehow or another they're going to be able to get them up and get them in, talk them in pull them in, get them in so that people don't see them out on the stoop and that the family then has the shame pulled down on them again. So they try and solve the They try the to problem. solve it. But, to yeah, paint but it over, do whatever they need to do. Whatever they need to do to get the person in the house so they're not seen outside the home. Okay, so that's one response. The second response, and uh, Vince, let me come to you on this one, would be the provoker, the person that wants to punish the person. Well, it's probably one of the most common responses is just to get angry, and uh, it's pretty easy to do. It's, it's an intense emotion. It sort of gives you some sort of a release, and uh, when it's all over, um, there's some satisfaction based on it. It doesn't do a lot of good. Um, it's an illness. It's not something that you can, um, you can deal with through um, anger or, or, or penalizing. It's a, it's a spiritual illness. It's one of the mind that assaults the soul, and it's one that has to be understood before you react to it. Okay, it's two of the four reactions. We have two more to go. Uh, let's go back to you and talk about the martyr, uh, the, the role that this person plays. Well, the martyr would be the victim, the martyr, look at what you, you did to me. How about the kids? Mm -hmm. um, or if it's a child, you know, bearing the uh, guilt of a, and shame of a parent. Uh, not raising the child properly, or so they think. Um, they also will 
sometimes be kind and they'll put they'll bring a blanket or a pillow and cover the person mm -hmm. but as the disease progresses there's no pillow and no blanket forthcoming and they just think woe is me after all I've done for you this is what I get and finally the fourth one back to you uh, is the enabler so there's a situation what does the enabler do well the enabler would probably make every excuse for this person and allow the behavior to continue um, that behavior could continue until something tragic happens, death, or uh, <clears throat> many other things that the addict suffers. And the enabler, out of their own guilt or whatever reason they may have, will prolong the uh, <coughs> progression down. Uh, the, okay, so uh, we, had the, we have the scenario down. We know that there were four different types. So we have the rescuer, the provoker, uh, the martyr, and the enabler. So the question is, so which one of those reactions uh, is actually helping the problem? And the answer is none of them. None of the above. None of them. So that goes against what we all as humans, I think, uh, think that we should do. So let me go to the, the question after that. So if you can't do that, if you can't do any one of those four things, what exactly should you do as a family member that's being affected? What's the correct reaction? Love and detach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's people out there and people in the audience. We're going to hear from them in just a little bit. There are people out there whose fathers, mothers, sons are addicts or alcoholics. And they're, they, they're trying to protect them. They might do the martyr. They might yell at it. They might do all this. And you're telling me that the correct reaction is to detach yourself from it. Yes. It's, it's tough. That. It's a very hard thing to do. So exactly how? What do you mean by, and, and I'm, I'm kind of playing a little devil's advocate here on, mm -hmm. on no, I, that. I, I mean, I respectfully believe it's a, it's a miserable disease, and it's, it's one that happens by degrees gradually over time, and so it's very difficult to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And it's even more difficult to tumble to that as being the correct solution. So those people, and, and Judge, you've, you, you've seen this. Um, I made a note here that uh, you see the damage, uh, you know, when it comes to you, and then of course, uh, you know what you're working with. So by detaching themselves from that, first of all, wouldn't they feel a sense of, well, I'm not doing enough? I think in many situations they do, depending upon the four characteristics that you already mentioned before. Mm -hmm. uh, we unfortunately see the uh, enabler in regard to whether it be a mother or a spouse that comes in and he has every excuse in the world as to why the person committed the crime, uh, why they're using. Uh, but unfortunately, we also see <clears throat> there's people here tonight in regard to uh, children youth services, the children that suffer, and that the children had to be taken out of the house, and yet the spouse will still support the uh, alcoholic and not detaching to recognize that it's the children and it's their role in life that they need to take care of, not the alcoholic. And unfortunately, they're not able to make that separation. So while it may look cold, the reality is in life, they're not only protecting themselves, but they're protecting their family by uh, detaching with love and just saying, I need to take care of myself, I need to take care of my children, not be cleaning up after his or her mess all the time. And we're gonna be uh, coming back to this, by the way, uh, throughout the whole hour, we're talking about detachment, and because uh, obviously that is the, the correct answer to all this, but it really needs to be explained, because if you're going through that, and you just heard us say that's the answer, I know that doesn't make sense right now. So we're going to try, and with our studio audience as well, uh, give you concrete examples to let you know that, first of all, it's not your problem. And as tough as that is, uh, you need to understand that. And Trish, let me come to you. If my father had cancer, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to help him. So if my father is an alcoholic, you're telling me to detach myself. And that would be how you help him. Let him let him feel the consequences of his behavior and that is how you help them and that is it's a very tough thing to do mm -hmm. but if your if your dad had cancer you would take them you know for chemo you would help them and with um with the alcoholic taking them to a bar doesn't help them or, or doing whatever they ask you to do if it's part of their addiction is not helping them and you just really have to identify that they have their consequences because family members we have our consequences for our behavior as well Again, I'm going to keep coming back to that. We invite you to be part of the program. Simply dial that toll-free number on the bottom of your screen, 
and you could be part of the program or go to wvia.org where you could sign on and you could submit your comment or question and we'll have that for you. Let's right now go to our uh, studio audience. We have Joe and we have our first person. Hello. Hi. Um, Introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Suzanne Jaffe and I am the uh, parent of a young man who has been sober for seven years and uh, very pleased with that. But I've been in a recovery program myself uh, as a family member for 11 years. So the timing doesn't always coincide. Um, when the doctor said love and detach, it brought me right back 11 years ago when uh, that was suggested to me. As a parent, I can say that I brought my son home from the hospital knowing that my job in life was to keep him alive and safe, and I did that every step of the way. When he walked, when he took his first steps, when uh, he slept at night, I watched his little chest go up and down, and then all of a sudden I found out he had a drug addiction, and someone said, now you just have to leave him to his own devices and let him find his own recovery. That was the scariest moment of my life. Um, I don't think I really got that. I know I didn't get that. I didn't get that for three and a half years. He managed to stay sober for three and a half years uh, by the grace of God, and then he relapsed. When he relapsed, I realized at that time that I could do nothing else. I had tried everything. You know, you spoke about those four phases of, of the, the woman whose husband was asleep in the yard. I was that mother, you know. I, the one thing you didn't say was as soon as you hear the door in the lock, you're sitting in the living room waiting for him to come home, you open the door. But that's what, as a mother, I did. I just anticipated every need and I fixed everything. When I realized I couldn't fix anything anymore and it was my, what I refer to as my bottom, the bottom that an alcoholic has to reach, I, I reached that point where I just couldn't do anything else and I just didn't have the energy or the wherewithal to try anything else. I realized that I had to turn my son over to himself, and um, that's what I did. Fortunately, because of that, I think he got better, and I know I got better. One, one, if I could ask you to comment one more time on something. So those that are watching, I said it's a, it's a tough show, but there are people that are watching that know a family member that's either an alcoholic or addict, and they think they've got their bases covered, and that they think there's nothing wrong with them, themselves, and they're, they're or, like I say, get the other bases cover. Comment on that, if you would. If you saw me when my son was in active addiction, you would know that I wasn't okay. You know, I didn't eat, I didn't sleep, I wasn't functioning, I wasn't communicating with friends, um, I didn't want to go to work, I wanted to be home to sit by the phone and wait for the phone call. So to say it's not affecting a family member, I'd be hard pressed to find a family member it's not affecting. I honestly always have said that the alcoholic gets some temporary relief when they're using their drug or alcohol of choice. A uh, family member gets no relief because we're just sitting there waiting for them to implode. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, we welcome our uh, audience members uh, to, that's why they're here, because they wanted to share their stories as well. They've been through it and they know that there's, there's a lot of help out there. And we're gonna be uh, telling you about some of that help. Uh, again, I want to go around the panel again and talk about how it specifically affects the family. If you are the, because we always assume the father's the addict or whatever. First, let's not assume that because that's not true. So if you're the father, how, you know, if you're, your spouse is the addict or uh, alcoholic or your son, how does that change you? How does that affect you as a father? It does a lot of things. It affects uh, self-esteem. Uh, well, what what happens is the roles change within the family as well. Right. They become dysfunctional. Yeah, sure. But uh, I mean, what will happen is the child will end up assuming the roles of the parent. That type of thing. If it's an alcoholic uh, uh, father. Uh, you may end up with uh, an, an entire family structure that rearranges to take care of, of the whole, the piece that is, is missing. And, and, and with varying degrees of success, depends on how sick the, the, the family gets. Depends yeah. on the family architecture. We often see that often. <clears throat> the family member becomes almost a survivor. All the dysfunction that's going on, sure. they become a survival of that dysfunction. So now the, every day they are in survival mode of how they are going to either be surviving their action, the, the alcoholic's action, uh, or what they're going to do to preserve things. So therefore now their behavior becomes 
completely unmanageable often. And we see that in regards to their ability maybe to care for their children or to interact with others. Uh, it, it, a spillover effect that's not that this function doesn't end with the alcoholic, but really ends up with the survivors, that being the family members. And again, the whole theme through this is that the, the, the people that don't have, quote, the cancer, um, they're, they're not the alcoholic or addict, but they are truly affected. So let's go on to uh, what if you're the, uh, the, the wife and the, the husband is the, uh, the alcoholic or the addict. How does that change the wife's role? Again, very, becomes very dysfunctional. Well, not only dysfunctional, but for what we see often is that that uh, mother uh, will actually sometimes give up her responsibilities in regard to the children because she's covering for the alcoholic. And so therefore, all of a sudden, her role as a mother, uh, as a uh, as a sister, as an um, employee, whatever it may be, has been so spent in regard to the work that they're doing that they literally will give up their roles, which traditionally would be, whether it be a mother or uh, a wife. Why, I, I probably going to ask this a few times in different formats, but why do they do that? Why do they take on that, that role? Does it just seem logical at the time? I, I think that every episode that happens in the home, they just deal with that. They're not looking at the whole picture. They have distorted thinking. They become abnormal trying to make everything look normal. Mm -hmm. So they're not really thinking about what is going on every, every day because every day there's always something different to handle, to manage, to control. Or lots of times, uh, mothers in particular, as the kids get older, the oldest child becomes the uh, caretaker in the house. The mother takes to the couch. Depression is a, is a, a real thing for a spouse of an alcoholic. And um, they just usurp their roles. And, and the, the dad is drinking drunk, and the kids are guiding themselves, raising themselves. The oldest child has that role, which is um, not, not fair, but that's what happens. And the, and the wife becomes angry, but yet protective of the, of the spouse. Mm -hmm. And then they become frustrated, and then they become loving. And, and it's just, they, they go to extremes. They go to extremes. We look at the number of cases, in, for example, domestic violence. The number of women that become victims of domestic violence, and the police arrive, mm -hmm. and the first thing they do is the women start attacking the police officers, saying, leave him alone. <laughs> and uh, the whole thing gets you know, completely <laughs> turned around as to who is at fault here. And then they come into court, and the exact same thing. They'll be they'll rather abandon their children sometimes to defend the alcoholic and they, they may come in all bruised up or from a hospital bed. And so the a thought of mm -hmm. rational decision making uh, or what the big picture here is is not really what's in their mind but just what they're going to get through today. So they'll come in the court at that time and say no I don't want to press charges, no I don't want to do anything and the dysfunction continues. That's correct. And then you've got a next generation that's right. affected by it. That's my next question. Right. The children of uh, growing up in an alcoholic home um, or the addict's home. Mm -hmm. um, I doubt very many children are watching this program right now, but there are a lot of children that grew up that are now adults or adult children of alcoholics. They are profoundly affected. Yes, they are. Um, and they don't know it. Mm -hmm. How are they affected? Well, seven out of ten children of alcoholism are affected, and I'll repeat the behavior. They'll either become an alcoholic, marry an alcoholic, or both. The other three, they don't get all scot-free. They think, oh, uh, they wind up perfectionists, workaholics, angry adults. I deal with a lot of adult children of alcoholism, and they're very angry. They're, they're perfectionists and they not only demand it from themselves but they demand it from everybody else because when they came from a family of alcoholism they said that will never happen to me, I'll never be like him, I'll never be like her and when they find out that they're in that same exact situation mm -hmm. they get pretty angry and unless they deal with that and get some help and healing for that they stay angry which is sad. We're going to take a uh, question from the audience then we're going to go to our phones and again we invite you to be part of the program either by calling that toll-free number on the bottom of your screen or going to our website at wvia.org and you can submit your question there. Please do not turn away because we still have not even talked about what type of treatment there is and there is a lot of treatment for the family, spouses and children that are growing up or, or that are in this situation. So please don't turn away. Let's go back to our uh, audience. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I am uh, Nick Colangelo and um, I am a, uh, a living statistic of everything that's being discussed up there. Uh, I was a uh, child, nine years old, and what we're not talking about is how a child gets frightened and how that fractures the developmental system 
and how the imagination puts the life together as a child of an alcoholic. I'm also statistically the person who became an alcoholic and as a perfectionist, and as an overachiever, and as everything else. And the good news is that there is hope through um, information and uh, through assistance and um, what we call treatment to where people can be restored. And the damage of uh, early childhood can turn into uh, assets. I know there's... Um there's a lot of books out there. Is that, that the way you found help, or did you seek treatment? Um, books, I wasn't looking for an answer. I was too busy fighting with everybody over everything. And once, uh, and I think it's fair to say that the alcoholic in my life became sober when I was nine years old, but no one ever talked about it. There was no information sharing. There was just the stopping of the drinking. And then there was the dysfunction of the household and the separation of all the members of that family, not making contact, not talking about it, not talking about a solution, and moving on with their lives, and then the discomfort or the pain that I had, not known to me, was relieved greatly once I drank alcohol. And then I became alcoholic and began a process of uh, suffering consequences and uh, asking for help from other people but not willing to do what was suggested and eventually wound up receiving treatment. The proper information, the, uh, the proper education, and then the willingness to follow the instruction and then the solution presents itself. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing uh, that. That's what we want. And again, folks, these people are here uh, of their own free will and they are letting you know that there is help out there, that you are affected, but there is help out there. Let's go to our phones right now and take our first phone caller and this person I would like to be anonymous, that's fine, and this person is calling from Scranton. Go ahead and welcome to Call the Doctor. Hello. Hi, go ahead please. Uh, this is not a question, it's just a statement if you have a little bit of time, okay? <coughs> sure. I have two sons. Are born nine and a half months apart. They are now 44 years old. My oldest, <coughs> whose name I won't mention because he's been in Marworth and he's been to Clearbrook and he's been to Choices, okay? He started doing heroin in his late teens. He eventually ended up in New York City. He thought he was very funny, he went to be a comic, and he got heavily into heroin. He sold dope for a Chinese gang where he was supposed to make $25,000. It was a sting. He was arrested, federal charges. He did nine months in a federal boot camp in Mineville, New York. Uh, when he came out, he came to Pennsylvania for clothes, myself and my family. I mean, he didn't want to wear the prison work boots and that kind of deal. And he, did, he looked wonderful. That's the healthiest I've ever seen him. That was 13 years ago. Mm. He is an official missing person. Uh, it's all with the FBI. I did everything that I should have, you know, 13 years. Okay, son number two went into the Army trying to get away from dope in the small town here in Lackawanna Valley where he lived. And he served proudly in special ops in the Middle East. When he came home from the Army, he had been stationed at Fort Sill in Oklahoma, so he stayed there. I never had a permanent address or phone number for him. I would have to wait for him to call me. In the summer, this past summer, I got a phone call from his ex-girlfriend telling me he was in trouble. And I said, what do you mean by trouble? Well, he'd gone from 175 pounds to 140, and he was really, really hooked real bad on meth. And the last she heard was that he checked into detox, and then he checked himself out after three days. My comment is drug addiction takes your soul. It just, there, there aren't words. These kids were altar boys, and they were Cub Scouts, and they were honor students, and they played football. And I'll let dope kills. And that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling in. Thank you. Let's go to any comments on 
I think one of the things that uh, was mentioned there in regard to one that was arrested, uh, awfully hard to say this to family members, but sometimes an arrest is the best thing that can happen mm -hmm. to an addict or an alcoholic. It actually not only arrests their conduct, but arrests sometimes their addiction at that spot, at that point. And at that point, as was mentioned before, then there is the help that can be accessed. So the thought of somebody being arrested, well, many family members say, that's horrific, I, I want to protect my uh, husband or my daughter. Uh, there's a number of families that actually call up the police and say, you have to stop my son or daughter because they're going to die if you don't mm -hmm. do something. Mm -hmm. Because they're robbing from everybody, they're, they're you know, using every day. So the idea of somebody being arrested, well, traditionally we'd say that's a terrible thing for my family member. In this particular case, when we're talking about addiction and alcoholism, sometimes it's the only way in which you're going to be able to stop that person at that point in time. Jim, we're already at the uh, halfway point. I want to show you some uh, slides where you can get some more information, and uh, then we're going to reintroduce our panel members, and we're going to talk about uh, in specifics where you can get um, what type of treatment, what type of treatment there is. Again, this is not for the alcoholic or the addict. This is for the family, the family members. First of all, Clearbook uh, Treatment Centers. Uh, just do what I do, folks. Google it. It's, it's a lot easier. Uh, clearbrookinc.com, and uh, they got a great program. We're going to hear about that. Lackawanna Susquehanna Office of Drug and Alcohol Programs. Uh, again, we're going to hear from uh, Judge Varese on that one. Uh, Better Today, uh, Inc., and we're going to hear uh, about that from uh, Vince in just a second. And also Geisinger Health System uh, with what they have with their treatment centers, um, which is the uh, Marworth Chemical Dependency uh, Center. Let me reintroduce quickly our panel members uh, that we have during this program. The first guest we have is David Withers, and he practices addiction medicine and serves as the Associate Medical Director for the Marworth Chemical Dependency Treatment Center. That's a part of the Geisinger Health System. Our next guest is Trish Colangelo, a certified addiction counselor and consultant for the Family Focus Program at Clearbrook Treatment Centers. Also joining us is Judge Michael J. Barace from the Lackawanna County Treatment Court and the National Drug Court. And we have with us also Vince Carolyn, a licensed social worker and a certified alcohol <coughs> and drug counselor for a Better Today, Inc., an adjunct facility, and also an adjunct facility member at Misericordia University. Again, for the remainder of the show, if you'd like to be part of it, simply dial that toll-free number at the bottom of your screen, or you can go to our online community at wvi.org, and you can submit your question there. Uh, in fact, if we can, can we bring that first one up uh, from the online community, and we'll take that question. I believe this one is to, uh, to Trish, to you, and the comment is, how does drinking affect adult children, uh, the adult children later in life. You touched on that briefly before. Mm -hmm. First of all, the point, and, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, really, but they are affected. Definitely are affected. Sure. No, nobody skates. Nobody. Nobody gets away. Everybody is, has very long tentacles alcoholism, and it goes through generations. Children, adult children of alcoholism, they go one or two ways. They go completely, I don't want to be near anybody who <coughs> drinks. They don't marry anybody who drinks. They raise, raise perfect children, and they're more than willing to tell you that. And then, <laughs> and then you have the other one who says, well, I'll never be like him or her, but they become exactly like that person. I always say to the people that I deal with, take a look. It's Russian roulette. If you have alcoholism in your family, it's Russian roulette. Ask yourself how important that is to have that drink. And if it's that important, then maybe you need to check into Clearbrook. But it's um, very often they get very rigid and, and everything about them is um, angry. Their drug of choice is anger. And they, they just really go through life very irascible, critical, irritable, and then, then it passes to the next generation. And, and we, see pay, we see a lot of people, I see a lot of people where very often we're speaking, um, they're angry at the alcoholic, their parent, mm -hmm. but they're sometimes angrier at the non-alcoholic. Because they didn't do anything. Because they didn't do anything, they didn't protect them, they didn't guide them, they weren't there for them emotionally, and they're pretty angry at that person. And then they don't know it until they get some sort of help and start talking about it. So they need to get help. That's what definitely need to get help. If you grew up in that situation, you need to seek help because Absolutely. you were no affected. Absolutely, no question about it. You were affected by. You can't live day in and day out 
in an unpredictable world, and alcoholism is unpredictable, and you can't live as a child knowing, well, are they going to be in a good mood tonight, and if, it, if the alcoholic's in a good mood, so is everybody else. If they're in a bad mood, everybody gets in a bad mood, they start picking on each other, and, and you live like that, and you don't get away with that. We're going to talk about those specific help, uh, and we're going to go through each of our panel members uh, as they represent the uh, agencies that can help, <coughs> and uh, we're going to go into detail about that. Before we do that, let's go back to our uh, live audience. And again, I want to thank them for uh, being here tonight and uh, helping us because it's uh, basically I told them before the show it would be one thing if I just gave statistics and had an expert panel here. I said that would do something, but for them to come here and stand up and tell their story, I hope that's getting through to you because these people have been through this and they know what it's like to get help and be on the other side. So please, please take that to heart. Joe, our next. Uh, Person in the audience, your oh, name, please. Yes, I'm attorney Frank Bolock, yes. and uh, one of the hats that I'm privileged to wear is that I'm the president of the Treatment Court Advocacy Center in Lackawanna County. Um, first of all, I want to commend you, George, and the and the panel for a very powerful uh, program. And as you're talking about the addict and and kind of their loss of uh, the sense of self, uh, I think what I also see is the the family members and how they in their efforts to deal with the alcoholic lose that uh, sense of self and i wondered from the panel what what kinds of things uh, do family members do in order to to regain that sense of self great question i'll open it up to the panel i would say the single best best thing to do would be number one recognize it and then number two, avail oneself of 12-step of self-help uh, like Al-Anon and al -Anteen for children. I think depending upon how severe it is, uh, for themselves it might be going to Al-Anon or al -Anteen, but uh, often uh, depending upon if other family members are in jeopardy. Uh, it's amazing how many times we have cases in which uh, mothers or fathers are driving the car drunk and the children are in the car or sure. the, or the uh, child or is going to score drugs and they have an infant in the car and yet the mother, the grandmother being the caregiver of the, of the uh, grandchild is not doing anything knowing that her child is going to now drive away with this, this child. So there's many things besides just self-help in regard to what you need to do but also in order to reaching out so that others are protected. Yeah. Let's, let's go through that. Um, I'm sorry Vince you wanted to I was going to say, sometimes it's just taking action. If uh, you know, you hear what Frank is saying, just sitting down with somebody and giving them an opportunity to talk to you and say, this is happening in my life, and just seeing the relief come across them when they understand that there is hope and, and there is a potential solution. We're going to, uh, before we take some phone calls, by the way, we, are, uh, we will be taking those phone calls in just a second. I want to go through the panel, <clears throat> and if we could bring up on the screen, pardon my voice here, um, Dr. Withers, we'll start with you first uh, with the Marworth Chemical Dependency uh, Treatment Center, uh, part of uh, Geisinger uh, Health Center uh, or Health System. So a person is in that family, they come to Marworth, what, can, what kind of help can they expect? Well, mostly uh, in that scenario, it would probably be outpatient uh, type of counseling that would be available to the, the spouse or family member mm -hmm. and and they they frequently come with uh, a lot of you know wondering what's wrong with them and the reality is um, the whole family system is sick they did not cause the chemical dependency and they can't fix it and I think that recognition can be somewhat liberating uh, judge, and healing. I'm sorry uh, Judge Brace um, Lackawanna County Treatment Court and the National Drug Court first of all what are those? The uh, treatment court essentially is a person's arrested you're using the external pressure of the criminal justice system to hopefully bring upon internal change. That means essentially they're being brought into treatment saying here's the tools that you need to recover in regard to what you need to move forward in life. Uh, and then in lieu of that they're not just sitting in a prison the entire time. Mm -hmm. So there's an arrest and there may be prison involved but it also means that there's going to be treatment involved there. But the second part of that which is equally as important is it involves the families. We're very fortunate uh, this evening, uh, like every Tuesday night, there's a family-to-family -family, uh, session at St. Mary's held uh, in Scranton, which uh, Clearbrook uh, puts on. And so the parents and sometimes the siblings or spouses of defendants in our uh, courts must attend. And so it allows the entire family uh, to look at this holistically rather than just the defendant. 
Uh, also, you look at programs that are going to help uh, the children uh, that are being neglected because of the uh, alcoholism. So what are you going to do to make sure that they're protected and make sure there's not only a treatment being uh, provided but also uh, parenting programs? Uh, what are you going to do to make sure the spouses that now aren't receiving their uh, support uh, or alimony, whatever it may be, because of the fact that the person's not working? Uh, what can you do to put programs in place? All the collateral damage that the mm -hmm. alcoholic is doing to the rest of the family, the court looks to say, what are you going to do to make sure you're responsible uh, for what you need to do? We have a lot of phone calls. We'll be getting those in just a second. I want to go through the other uh, two panelists here and the, uh, the help that they offer through their agencies. Um, and Trish, will come to you with Clearbook Treatment Centers. Uh, what type of help would they provide? Clearbrook provides a weekend program for the families. We have a house specifically built for families to come and spend the weekend. And by families, I mean children from nine years old and up, siblings, grandparents, and whoever wants to come. And we do an education program because very often asking persons to say stop enabling or you're, they don't even know what we're talking about. So education is the key. Get them to understand and look at the symptoms, look at their behavior, what happened to you. And as soon as they start to see that and understand this is all part and parcel of the disease of alcoholism, it helps them to perhaps want to change, perhaps want to do better, perhaps understand what they can do. We also have, as the judge uh, mentioned, uh, seven different sites of a program that we have called Families Helping Families that Clearbrook Foundation sponsors. And that is in the Northeast Pennsylvania area as well as two is in Florida. And that's an education program and we offer that uh, an hour education. We do different persons lecture on different topics and then they go into a group discussion. And this group discussion, we ask family members not to be in the same group and it, that really helps them understand what happened to them, that their son or daughter didn't do it to them or their husband or wife and they're in, in a circle with people who understand where they were and lots of healing takes place. We've been doing this for 11 years with, with very good success in the Scranton area. And Vince, with you for a better today? Well, outpatient drug and alcohol has a sort of a different service. We're sort of at the front end and the back end. Often we'll have uh, families coming in with what we're going to call the identified patient when all of them actually are affected by the illness and we'll have to perform triage. We'll have to sit down and figure out what the problem is, who has the problem, and then where do we go. Um, the, the client, if we will, the person who's identified as the addict or alcoholic, they get treatment and uh, the rest of the family kind of doesn't. Um, you've heard a lot about information lacking and resources that are lacking. The need far outweighs what exists, especially for families. For the sure. addict, there's treatment. But for the family members, they go around ill for a while until they find some sort of relief from a service. Uh, we would refer our families down to families helping families or to an al -Anon meeting in their local area and in some cases we try to perform the family counseling ourselves. So folks there is help out there get yourself help. And again if you think that you're not affected you're just kidding yourself. Let's go back to our phones right now and say hello to uh, Marguerite uh, calling in from uh, Hanover Township. Thank you for waiting and welcome to Call the Doctor. Thank you for having, hearing me. I've had this question in my mind for such a very long time, it doesn't make any difference. Who answers it, maybe more than one opinion would be very good. Um, I don't understand how alcoholism and addiction are considered illnesses. There is a choice involved of something that you do to your body in order to make you get this. I mean, I realize there's a predisposition People sometimes are ignorant and they don't have the knowledge to steer clear of it altogether or be very cautious when they're drinking if they know it runs in the family. We're like diabetic, you know, it runs in the family. You try to watch your diet, you try to get information. I, I don't understand how it's classified the same thing as a cancer. That is a great great comment because the logic follows if it's not a disease they're doing it on their own therefore they can stop whenever they want and of course I'm not affected you know if I'm a part of the family. What it is a loss of, of free will on the part of the addict or the addict, uh, addict or alcoholic and probably in, in the same way to the affected family member. 
and so we now know that alcoholism or drug addiction is 50% genetic and 50% environmental. But at some point, the reward mechanism of the brain gets hijacked. And I mean, you can look at it, and the uh, addict or alcoholic's reward system gets hijacked, and they compulsively start to use drugs despite consequences. Uh, in similar fashion, uh, the family members sort of get addicted to the controlling problematic behaviors mm -hmm. that, that they eventually display or the anger or whatever. Actually, that caller brings a bridge over um, from one into the other. If, alcohol and drugs are symptoms um, of a much greater condition, dependence, addiction, and you can make the argument that just about everybody has some form of this condition, whether it's a level and degree, and the family members sort of evidence the same thing in what's called codependency and the dependent on the addict. And whether the addict's healthy or not, they have some compromised role. Let's go back to the phones again and say hello to Donna calling in from Scranton. Donna, thank you for calling and go ahead with your comment or question. Hi, I am a, a mom of a 24-year-old of a who's been babbling. Um, actually was in treatment for the second time just recently. And um, it was so hard to get him in treatment. He made the decision. He called me from a, he just started a great job and said, Mom, I have to leave. I need help. And I was, I was happy that he was telling me he needed help because it has to be on their own that they want the help. You can't get help for them. I was the giant enabler of all enablers. I just wanted to fix them. And, and I know now that you can't fix them. They have to want the help. It was so hard to get them the help. We went through every avenue we could. Um, there were no beds available. He was under our insurance because his insurance didn't kick in yet. He finally got in for the second time to treatment at Marworth. The first time it was phenomenal, but he wasn't ready at that point, which they have to come to the point that they want the help. And this time he was really ready and making such progress and sharing things that were so stuffed that was, was causing him such uh, a hard time. And they deemed that he was ready to go, that he can go out and have intensive outpatient. However, he didn't get intensive outpatient. He got a group. I'm thankful to God that he is doing what he needs to do, but in the height of his addiction, they'll steal, they'll rob, whatever they have to do to get the money to get that fix. And to Marguerite, they don't want to be addicts. It starts out getting high at first, but then they actually need the drug so they don't get sick because they're that dependent on it. They need it just to, get, not, to not feel sick anymore. So now that he is He's going to meetings and doing all he has to do. Um, this, I guess, is to the judge. He's got to, um, he's got to do for what he did in his drug use. He's got to um, confess to what things he did do, which now he just started a good job. He has a little baby, and he's, you know, going to meetings and on the right track and going to the outpatient. And it's just scary because it it's, could ruin his life. To go into jail now is going backwards, but people don't realize, I mean, he was a good boy. He is a good boy. He's a wonderful, wonderful person who got hooked on this opiate, and anybody, it could happen to anybody. I just want people to know it could happen to anybody, and I was an enabler, and I just wanted everything to be okay, but I know now that it's out there, and I work in the health field, and I see how easy it is for people to get addicted to drugs and they don't even know, you know, how bad it could get. Um, I thank you and I just ask, like, uh, what advice would I have? Um, I, I just don't want to see him go backwards, but what about insurance? Why did they let him go? Like, who, who decides that they're to go? And, you know, it's so hard. I know that things change with insurance and it's different now, but I don't think the help is that easy to get as we, we think it is. So I don't know if there's any avenues or any advice for me as to what he could do. He is going to meetings regularly, once a day, you know, and, and right, no Don, I'm now. sorry, I need to cut you off there. First of all, thank you very much for uh, calling in, um, but we have other callers and uh, comments. If you'd like to answer her question. I think there's some great points that uh, yeah. Donna made. First of all, uh, you know, treatment is not always available to everyone. 
Right. It's very difficult. We have great treatment providers here at the table. We have great treatment providers here in the audience, but often accessing it's very difficult for families and for individuals. Hopefully we're going to see changes in that in, in the new laws. However, the reality is you can't just go, you can go into an ER if something happens to you in regard to a medical side, even though we look at it as disease, doesn't necessarily mean that we have that same type of parity in regard to uh, treatment uh, for addiction and alcoholism, the same way with mental health. So that's on the one part, I think she's very correct in that, and often it's very difficult. The second part is that we have to realize that once a person commits a crime, there's a certain level of accountability there that has to be done. Mm -hmm. A person that's truly in recovery and doing it realizes that there's that accountability. We try to take in, as a mitigating factor in regard to their sentencing, if they're doing what they truly are, are trying to do in regard to recovery to mitigate their sentence so it won't be as great. But as, you, as everyone's probably aware, at the time of sentencing, everybody finds God and decides that's going to be a, a holy day mm -hmm. and not necessarily embracing religion for the right reason. <laughs> Let's go back to, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would just like to add to Donna, for, she keeps saying that her son goes to meetings, which is great. I would, my input to her would be for her to go to meetings as well. Right. Again, the, and again, I echo that because uh, they don't know that they're affected. Right. And they are. We've got about four minutes left here. Let's go back to our studio audience and introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Helen, and I am a recovering family member as well. George, thank you very much for putting this panel together. It's really important for the community. And one thing that I want to um, say is that there is help, and I personally have received that kind of help. I've experienced the horror and the heartbreak of alcoholism for generations. And although neither one of my parents were alcoholic, my grandparents, extended family, and there, have been a lot of, there has been a lot of death, including the death of my beautiful sister. And I want Donna to know that, and Marguerite to know, that she had a, the disease of alcoholism, but she did not want to, to be an addict. And no family, member, uh, no family member wakes up and says, you know what, I think I'd like my child, my son or daughter to be an alcoholic today. So my point is <coughs> that I'm just grateful that you're removing the stigma and that there is help out there. And I really want to thank the panel. You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to our phones very quickly. We've got two minutes left. Tony from Old Forge. Tony, welcome to the program. Your comment or question quickly, please. Uh, yes, uh, I have a 24-year-old son that uh, he, uh, he was a prodigy of my husband and I when we got divorced. And uh, then he went on drugs. And I said, uh, he blamed me all the time because I got divorced and it's my fault and, and the denial. And then so he made me feel guilty and I, I gave him a place to stay. And, and then, like, he, he stole things that were there and, and took advantage of the situation. And then I had him kicked out by the police. Would it, would it have been better if I had him arrested to leave my premises for stealing things and doing that? Because now he's out. Now I don't know where he is. And to get, to get him into that program, as uh, you know, Mr. Bray said, you know, sometimes it's better to get them in trouble and then start them off and then let them realize it in that, in that manner. Tony, better Tony, if I had him arrested? Tony, thank you for that question. The answer very quickly, please. There really is no magic answer for all that. Hopefully we can get somebody into treatment, preferably that's the way to do it. Uh, but sometimes there's some hard love, as, as we know, and uh, that involves if a person truly is devastating the family by stealing and then hurting people, uh, then you need to really arrest the individual's conduct, and by that might be a criminal charge. Uh, if, if they're successful and they truly want treatment afterwards, those charges are dismissed. We uh, are fortunately out of time. I talked to the studio audience before the uh, program started and I told them simply this. Uh, this program means a lot to me uh, because I know the topic intimately. Uh, I grew up as a child of an alcoholic. Uh, my father passed away eight years ago. I don't remember the eighth grade. I remember about 30 seconds of a bus trip and a little bit of a uh, basketball game and that's it. Uh, but I got help. Someone bought me some books about growing up as a child of an alcoholic, and in my 20s, I got that help. And I'm here to tell you, from me to you, and it wouldn't be right for me to ask these people to be here uh, without disclosing that to you. If you're in that situation, then please realize that there is help out there. I'm telling you, I know, I've been there. Don't kid yourself. If you're part of that family unit, in whatever capacity, uh, the alcoholic or the addict, you are affected and you do need to get help. 
I'd like to thank our panel members for joining us. Thank you, uh, David Withers, or Dr. Withers, uh, Judge Brace, uh, Trish Colangelo, and Vince Carolyn. Thank you for being here, and our studio audience. I'm George Thomas. Thank you for joining us, and make sure you watch us next week for another informative Call the Doctor. Thank you.